great relationships don't just happen. If you want one, you've got to make it yourself. But how do you do that when you didn't have the models and examples that you needed? Some of us were lucky enough to have seen one or two solid marriages growing up. But that's not really enough since what worked for them isn't necessarily going to work for you. And lots of us just started doing marriage and love and relationships the way we thought was expected, only to find ourselves in a love story that's, I don't know, okay, I guess? There's no right one right way to do love. That's good news. You can let go of all that old baggage and craft a marriage or partnership or chosen family or polycule or whatever that is so much more than okay. It's really the creation of a life that finally feels like home. At least, that's what doing this has felt like for me. Me too. And getting here wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for us. We learned the hard way, the very hard way, that love is a verb. And the actions of love don't just come naturally. We all need skills and tools and support to do this well. And that's completely normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, research psychologist and ASECT certified sexuality educator. I'll be sharing personal stories, evidence-based research, and case studies from my work as a relationship coach. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Um, I'm a human doing my best to make relationships my biggest priority in life. We're going to dig deep and offer vulnerable conversations between us as we keep learning how to customize our love and keep growing as individuals. As individuals. As individuals. And as a couple. And as a moresome. It's all very interesting. And we're also going to have some amazing nuanced conversations with experts who can help you learn more ways to design the life you want. And if you find yourself saying at any point, damn, I really needed to hear that while you're listening, I would love it, we would love it, if you would head over and give us a quick rate and review on iTunes. It really does help other people find us, and we'd be so grateful for that. Now, it's time to reimagine your relationship from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. Hey there. Let's talk about purity culture. That's a... Yes, let's. Yes. Let's talk about that. Okay, so this one might feel a little off topic for our audience. It might feel like it's coming out of nowhere. But I promise you, where this conversation goes matters to a lot of people. And it might matter to you even if you think it doesn't. So what is purity culture? Let's get... Let's let's define it. Let's talk about what we're talking about. Okay, the basics of purity culture. It's about being raised in a religion that focuses on the idea that bodies are shameful, sex is shameful. Um, It's it tends to be incredibly gender binary, gender um, non inclusive. But the real bottom line to purity culture is where is about the surrendering of of sexuality to well. A religious patriarchy, really. It's it's not cool. And I'm not cool with it. I think it's obvious that on this podcast, not cool. we're not, we're not down, cool with that. down with that. But we have a great guest today. Um, we have Lauren Barnes with us. And I'm so, so excited. Lauren Elise Barnes. Lauren Elise is amazing. But, Ken, I wanted to just check in with you before we introduce mm-hmm. the interview that I did with Lauren. I did this interview with Lauren because Lauren is a former student of mine. And I knew we would have a really delicious conversation. Now, honestly, I didn't know whether you'd be able to get a word in edgewise uh-huh. since she and I go So this and is go. my chance. This, this is your my chance. Opportunity. But I thought it was worth just naming for our audience that we were both raised in churches. Yes. Yep. Now, neither of us, well, at least I, I don't identify as Christian. I do not now. identify as Christian. Um, however, I do still feel very comfortable in the Christian church that I was raised in. I feel very comfortable there. Or, and actually, in the Christian church you were raised in. I, yeah. And when I say church, I mean literally the building. Like, I like going to the building and visiting it for conference. I have pleasant memories of people there. Um, yeah. yeah. So, we had two very different experiences of church growing up. And probably two different ways that they impacted our sexuality. 
Yes, I so would imagine. I got to choose to go to church. My mother was agnostic at best. Um, atheist was definitely on the table, though she would describe herself usually as an agnostic and was pretty hostile about religion. Did not have me baptized um, or christened when I was born um, and did not take me to church. My father considered himself a born-again Christian, but never went to church, was not interested in formalized religion, even though he'd been raised in it and, and she'd been raised in it. They just sort of left it on the table. And my, my great aunt sort of scooped me up at a couple years old and took me to church, the congregational church, and, and I loved it. I just loved it. I enjoyed going to church. I loved the attention. I loved the, like, being with everybody. I just loved it. So we went. And a lot of my experience there was really lovely. And I don't think I ever heard a thing about sex. It was very neutral. And I was allowed to question the heck out of our minister. Okay, allowed. They did not <laughs> like it at all. But I never got... You were not tossed out for doing it? I was it? not tossed out. I would get spoken to harshly. But I was allowed to be the questioning little pain in the butt that I was. And when it came to sex and sexuality, yeah, it was just kind of not talked about that's my at all. That, that was my experience at and my i church. took that to mean okay it's none of their business that's literally how i took it. i was like it, it's clearly none of their business they're not talking about it i'm enjoying masturbating like a fiend so whatever that's none of their business how about you well um as i said my my church didn't my church didn't talk about it much um i think that the pastor's kids did uh, you know, there were there was an aspect of the social uh, environment, not the church itself, but the people, and there would be separate from church or groups, and and um, they were a little more down to earth than the church itself was. Mm. But my issue coming into it, and like my the, my experience was, my family never, not once, not ever talked about sex. Mm. Um, not about other people having it, not about us having it. My mother gave me a medical book about how the human body worked. That was the extent of it. Yeah, that's not helpful. So walking <laughs> into a, uh, a church where it was, again, not talked about at all, um, left me with the sense of, well, I guess, so op the fun... Nobody talked about it in your church. And you were like, well, then I guess it's fine. Nobody church talked about it in my family or church. So I was like, well, I guess it's horrible then. Yeah. <laughs> and shameful. And I shouldn't talk about it. And I shouldn't admit having any part of it. It was and left. So that was my It was left to interpretation. Of... And we did very different things with those interpretations. Yep. Like, I was out as bisexual. And it never occurred to me that my church would have anything to do with that or anything to say about it. But I remember when my cousin was coming out in a different church, actually, in the church you grew up in. Yep. Um, I remember it being a little seat, like, like, I remember there being a lot of weight around the conversations. I, I was, I'm, I'm younger than they are. So, it, you know, it, it didn't touch my life directly, but it wasn't like it was just an open, like, Hey, we can just talk about this and it's easy. And it wasn't easy breezy, but yeah, I was so audacious about my psychology. I was just like, I, this is mine. It never occurred to me as a teenager that it was for anybody else to own. So, But I don't really know why other than my parents didn't hide sex from us. I grew up on a hobby farm and I grew up, my parents had like print pornography and it was just like in their bedroom and I could like, I could see it there, whatever. Um, I definitely knew where to find it when I got a little older and I wanted it. But it was normalized to a degree that left me feeling like, well, this doesn't have anything to do with people who want to control me or change me. And that's not to say that there weren't other places where I felt like the church was oh. very much t telling me how I should be, who I should be, what I should do, because I definitely got messages that I needed to limit my academic potential, that I practice being a wife, that I should hook up and figure out how to just live a normal, good life. I, I got a lot of mor morality mm -hmm. issues. So I don't know how it is really that I made a bubble around sex and sexuality, but I'm really glad I did because listening to Lauren's story and even listening to you over the years tell me about what it was like to grow up 
And have accidentally sort of put sex into the shame box. Yeah, I didn't mean to do that, but... And Lauren's was. stories go many years deeper than mm-hmm. that about what happens. Yeah, what I got was a lack of guidance. I didn't get a lot of, like, uh, explicit messages that I should not be talking about sex or having sex or not. Like, no, no explicit messages about sex at all. So no guidance. But no... Uh, no crushing um, weight of judgment about it either. Right. But I don't remember either of us getting a lot of messages about body autonomy. Nope. Or the ability to negotiate um, and and set boundaries and yeah. well, this was one of the problems asking for consent. Of no one ever talking is it, it was absolutely written in my core that it's not something you talk about no matter what what which meant that's not good that's yes. very, very much not good and you and i got together you were 43 years old yeah and you were unable to have a consent conversation huh? just completely unable no that's not something you're talking and about and the safer sex conversation i mean i had to like that's scary right like not being able to have the safe sex conversation talk about stis and right ooh, i mean that was hard stuff. there was a lot of learning to do yeah. there for both of us and, and trying to figure out how we were going to talk about this because you like there's not there was no framework in there and i encourage our audience to just like if you're listening to this and you're not sure whether you this particular issue is yours but you're still hanging in there because you like ken and i (laughs) (laughs) listen to at least part of this episode and think about the places where you were not fully invited into being an embodied human with um the the availability of sexual pleasure, um, the ability to love your body just as it is and to have it be yours inside, outside, and upside down from a marriage. I think this is a a really profoundly impactful story to hear. And Lauren really has lived out and has transformed her own life and now other people's lives by sharing her story. That's, that's wonderful. So... Lauren is um, a trained sexuality educator with 20 plus years of public speaking experience. So she is an entertainer and you're going to love this. She specializes in working with clients who were harmed by purity cultures and other forms of religious oppression. And you'll see links in the show notes to where you can find Lauren's work and how you can take some of her classes. She does some of these by distance. So if this is you, please, please listen in. Um, But she, she focuses on helping people who are harmed by purity cultures and other forms of religious oppression. A proud musical theater nerd, Lauren makes evidence-based sexuality education fun and accessible. And That's great. I just love the heck out of our conversation. So here you go. So welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast, Lauren. Thanks so much for being here. I am so, so thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. This is exciting for me because we are making the shift. This happens to be recorded as the first episode of season six, where we're making the shift to video podcasting. We're making the shift to including more guests. And I get to talk to somebody who, I don't know, from the moment we connected through your time learning as a sex educator and my time teaching, I felt like we're going to have to have a bigger conversation. And today's the start of that. I'm excited. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so, like you said, I, from the moment I was introduced to you as a student in IC. Yeah, I just felt this connection like, oh, this human, I want to learn more from this human. So I've been excited for this day for a long time. So I'm glad to be here. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think it's really fascinating when I get to connect with people who are coming to the sex education world from just a completely different perspective. So you and I just, we had very different growing ups and yet we both landed in sexual education and specifically in de-shaming. Like, I feel like that's the theme in both of our work is like, how can we destigmatize? How can we de-shame? How can we let people have access to more of ourselves? So people have heard my story lots, but I would love for you to share, how did you get here caring so much about what you care about? Such a fun story. I'll try to give 
highlights because it's something that fascinates me too. So my background is in musical theater. And so I think as a small person, I've always been fascinated by narrative. So I'm always so intrigued by the question you just asked, how did you get here? Because in the theater, we're always asked to develop like a backstory of our character, right? They don't just appear on stage. They always brought something to this time and place. And that's, I'm sure your experience in working with humans too, right? It's the, our actions right now are indicative of whatever we came from. Um, so while I grew up in theater, um, I grew up in a very small conservative town in central Virginia. It's called Lynchburg. And yes, is directly connected to lynching. And mm. I mean, it's, it's a tough space um, full of beautiful people like anywhere in this country, um, but also full of a lot of evangelical Christianity, American Christianity. I like to always differentiate between because I think you go anywhere else in the world and Christianity might mean many, many things. So I want to be really clear, very full of fundamental evangelical white American Christianity. Um, and so fully enmeshed in it that I really didn't know anything else. So I don't, my childhood wasn't necessarily traumatic because my bubble, my scope, right, was like right here. I was like a horse with blinders. I didn't, I didn't know any better. I really mm -hmm. grew up thinking what I was doing was the holy way. What everyone else was doing was the sinful way. Um, so walking that line. I was homeschooled. Both of my parents went to the very evangelical Christian school, Liberty University. Um, for those, some might be aware of the whole, yeah, gangster capitalism podcast, which kind of highlights the corruptness of that place. Um, and so again, I, it was homeschooled. My, my vantage point was very small and yet I was very involved in musical theater. Um, mm. so I, I kind of had one foot in both worlds, the creative, the fantasy, the dreaming, the play. Um, but it's like, that was for there, not for my life. Um, and as I was growing up, my parents, I, you know, I'm the oldest of five children. So I was a guinea pig. They didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. call our eldest, we call her the first pancake. You're like, yeah. did the best I could. Sorry. Yeah. So I also, I like to tell everyone I work with, I do not think that any parent goes in, not, and I shouldn't say any, most parents do not go into parenting desiring to harm their children. They don't go in with ill intent. I would say the majority, sadly, you and I have worked with too many people. We know there are some evil there people. There are some out. really tragic stories, but. There are some bad people. Yeah. And yes, I do not believe that my parents went into placing me deep inside of what is known as a purity culture with the intent to give me life lasting harm. I, I don't think they were like, ah, this is what we'll do. Um, so they were no you know, conniving in the background. No. Yeah. Nobody in fact, it probably came from quite the opposite. They probably yeah. had great yeah. intentions. Yeah. No, my mom was a movie star. My dad was a division one athlete. Um, they both had really traumatic other things happened in their lives outside of any form of faith or spirituality. So when they found spirituality, Christianity, right? It was, ah, we can protect our sweet baby girl mm -hmm. from all the pain that we experienced by having a right and wrong and this type of thing. Yes. So, that, you know, so yeah, they were yeah, doing that. From the heart. Yes. And yes. yes. Really believe and yet. So, um, you know, in the 1980s, I won't talk too much about purity culture right now because we can have that discussion, okay. but um, there was the AIDS crisis, of course, and um, Christian communities were like, aha, we have the, the solution that is abstinence until marriage and only marriage between a man and a woman. And that is the solution. That is how we'll make everything better. Then you throw in a little greed and corruption on the side and it makes a, makes a spectacular little meal. So, I mean, I was born in 1985. So I'm like right in the whole blossoming of purity culture. Um, a man named Joshua Harris wrote this book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye. And it kind of went through all youth groups. Um, and then I take it a step further, was part of a Presbyterian congregation, which for those who are non-religious would not know this, but they were referred to as the frozen chosen. Oh. Um, we, we are- I've never heard it, that one. Yeah, yeah, super theological, like super, super, super heady, um, super male dominant, mm -hmm. super patriarchal in culture. Um, women were not to do anything. I grew up firmly believing that females should not be president, that they, that their menstrual cycles made them literally incapable of holding positions of leadership. And I believed these things. Like I, 
I believed them deeply. So came up, never dated, read all of these books on courtship that referenced the glory days of the early 1900s um, and how beautiful things were back then. If we could just return to the 1900s, things would be Setting good. on the porch. And getting corded, right? Yeah. And mention all the other horrible things mm. that were happening then. Um, so yeah, I you know wasn't permitted to date. I, I We'll talk about the downfalls later. Um, I had one guy that I would, was courted by um, in later high school um, and truly thought I was going to marry him, truly thought I was going to marry him. Um, and so when things fizzled there, that was devastating. Um, and then met what ended up being my husband um, when I was only 18 years old. And the, the primary message of purity cultures is that you will be a trampled rose, a piece of chewed up gum, mm -hmm. um, a cup of spit that's been passed around the more used up scotch tape. I've yeah. seen that one. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot of metaphors for this. Oh, a lot of imagery. Lot. Lot. Yeah. Um, the more romantic and or sexual partners that you have mm. for some, it's really only sexual, but definitely for my upbringing, it was romantic attachments as well. So meet this guy at 18, my parents, I think I thought liked him. He's seven years older. So he's kind of got his shit together and I'm like, okay, like, all right, this guy, I can have the romance I've been craving um, if this guy will just love me. And so purity culture, again, teaches women that they are to be the subservient under a, a head of household, a male, and that women are less than. I grew up with all these confusing messages like, Lauren, you could do anything. And yet, remember, your primary place is in the home. Yeah, I'm thinking about this, like the 90s in particular, there was this big tone of like girl power. Yes. It must have been at such odds. With, I, you know, looking back, my sweet, poor parents, uh, we grew up across the street from a, like a women's college, powerhouse women's college. Yeah. They, all my tutors were from there. They were like brilliant minds. We had them over all the time. And it was like, yes, but, you know, I don't, I don't think they knew. I, I don't think they knew what they were Well, most doing. people don't think about what happens when there's a schism, right? When we are presented two oppositional ideas with no sense of how to hold the tension of them or how to navigate and find our own path, third path through them. I don't like, we could talk about a lot of culture. Uh -huh. oh, and, that and, then, and then you make it a child, right? With not, right. Uh, their frontal lobe well, not. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't have the ability to make these decisions. I didn't have the ability to step back and go, oh, whoa, whoa. Um, there's a slight conflict in this logic here. Like, hmm, that's confusing. Could you explain this to me, mother and father? Because indoctrination, again, my parents were to be obeyed, right? There was no discernment that was ever talked about. It was just blind obedience, constant obedience. So meet this guy, um, make myself less and less and less and less and less and less until, and more and more and more codependent till he needs me, till I have proven that I am kind of like indispensable for his needs. Um, we have a fine relationship now, but he would be fine with me sharing that he struggled with mental illness. He struggled with all these things that I, it's kind of like I just cozied up in there, right? Like let yeah. me make myself indispensable because that's what I'm supposed to be as a woman. Um, and then it was just miserable. <laughs> we got married and set a, a catechism cosmic amount of events, um, addiction on his side, alcoholism, um, all of this stuff. And I, again, for so many years, never even considered that this was unhealthy, that he was not sexually attracted to me at all. I cried myself to sleep so for so many years. And here I had been led to believe, right, that if I kept Marriage. myself from that piece of tape, I would have the most glorious sexual fulfilling marriage in the world and it was miserable but I didn't show it I didn't tell anyone because sex was not to be discussed that was between husband and wife you know I, I think what I teach on so much now is the long-lasting ramifications of purity culture yeah. that this this goes far much deeper into your psyche so I was married to him for a long time. And then somebody started having dreams about me. This is always such a fun part of my story. Someone just started having dreams and wouldn't leave me alone. They were like, something is going on and we need to talk. Yeah. And 
So yay for people listening to their intuition. Yay, yay, yay. And all that led to is them insisting I get into counseling in a good way. And all it took was one visit with a counselor. I mean, it was years of progress, but um, one visit with a counselor where she said, that's why don't, why don't we just put some boundaries in place? And then, you know, the boundaries are broken. You can have a natural consequence. That's what they are. And that's it. And within weeks he was removed from my home and yeah, went through a few years of completely deconstructing everything I believed and everything I had been taught because the divorce ended up basically painting a scarlet letter across my chest um, of what a sinful harlot. And while I had been suffering, I was earning all these like brownie points, these like Mm -hmm. Christian brownie points, like look how great Lauren is. But then the moment I started seeking help and taking steps towards healing, um, yeah, I was, the, the word was, she's gone rogue just everywhere. It was like, oh. well, she's gone rogue. <laughs> so she's yeah, off right. script. Yes. Right. Yeah. She's not following the narrative that we presented to her. And I tell everyone though, I wouldn't change it for the world. Cause it was in that moment that all of a sudden I saw, oh, I followed their rules. Right. And still did not do enough to prove myself worthy in their eyes. I was not believed. I was sat at a table, a round table with 12 other white men and asked to tell my story of sexual abuse and emotional abuse and physical abuse and (laughs) psychological abuse over and over and over. And it was this like, yeah, it was like the blinders fell off. And I thought if this is being done to me, a heterosexual white girl, oh my gosh, like this is what everyone's been saying that the evangelical fundamental Christian church in America has been doing to individuals. And so it was a beautiful moment of aha. Right. Um, yeah. And so during that time I was working in maternal health and so side, you know, bar, everybody's always living like a nice little double life, right? They're yeah. like, you have a work life, a regular <laughs> actual life pretending and people thought everything was fine and was working maternal health because in the United States of America, our maternal health statistics are horrible. You'd be safer in 60 other countries to go have your baby. Doesn't matter skin color, just go somewhere else and have your baby because it's that abysmal here. Um, Anyway, I had been working in that field and the more I would talk to women, the more I would understand that they didn't know their bodies at all. They They didn't know pleasure. They didn't know their bodies. Many of them didn't know how they had conceived and I was just blown away. And so I like would file it, right? I'd put like a little yep. check mark somewhere. Oh, that's funny. I don't mind. Weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then we that's tried when to- I got my start too. When I was like, really? oh, oh, yep. Yep. Oh, like another, another doula client who not only doesn't have her orgasm now, but actually never really did. And oh, oh yeah. yeah. Over and over oh. again. Over that. Check, and check, so check. we, in my organization that I had founded, we would have panel discussions because I truly, it's just so funny, right? To be like, you believed this, but you were living this lie. I truly believed in informed decision-making, right? Which is yeah. a very different principle. And so we would always have these panel discussions of different educators or pediatricians or midwives or OBGYNs who disagreed with each other. And I would say to the attendees, listen, this is so good. You get to see that there are multiple options to choose from. So it's just so funny what was coming out of my mouth in one world wasn't living it in another. Right. No. Well, that's that's fundamental, I think, for almost all people. We we often have one area of life where we can operate with our executive function, with choice and at our best self. And then another area where we are low functioning and not really able to just get by even. I think that's, I, I want to say it's certainly typical. It's certainly typical. And we see it happening. I see it all happening all the time with people who are not recognizing their strengths. I see it with cis white men who don't recognize their strengths at and capacity at work. They could bring it home. They could, they could bring that home and like, oh, now the home could run in a different way. Like there are so many cases of that. And you had one that literally could have led to your, I mean, I don't want to overstate the case, but we're talking death and destruction, mental destruction, if nothing else. But like I you were living I a dual life. That, longer it would have gone on. No, yeah. it was getting like incrementally more dangerous every year that went on. 
And you see this all the time. I mean, and I, I, I'm so glad also to the way that this opened my eyes to domestic abuse, because so often the risks of changing your life, leaving all of these things are so astronomical that a person who is in that domestic violence situation can't, can't even see. It's like risks, benefits, right. survival was important. Um, and add in and some you Right. If you can't picture another life too. I mean, my, my own first marriage, I left after uh, it, it got messy. It got really messy at the end. And it, it was about imagining something else was the biggest block, right? Imagining there is anything else. Because if you were raised, I was raised to believe that I would be lucky if someone just put up with my shit let alone. Like my father used to tease about tearing a $500 bill in half, taping half of it to the bottom of the ladder and the other half to my forehead. That will leave you in a spot where even though I don't think my first husband intended to harm me, I was wide open. I was practically begging to be harmed because I thought that that was the best it could be. I couldn't imagine something else. And the imagination is our most powerful tool hundred percent, right? I, I taught children in theater for forever. And you and I talked about this a little bit before that the beauty of a theatrical experience for me is the ability to imagine something and then create something from nothing right. and to create an entire world. And yet, if you can't see that world, right? I, I was given position papers on marriage and divorce from the Presbyterian church that used the word failure 14 times in the pen mm -hmm. paper. So by failing to keep her marriage, by failing to do this, I would be unfit for remarriage, right? I would be like almost unfit. I would, my like position in the church, my like membership of the church was going to be in question, right? My sense of belonging and sense of belonging is huge to human beings, right? right. And so right. it so was now like your not core needs beyond just your actual physical needs. I mean, you already, I'm sure we're in the position of like, well, how do I even make my life start again? But now you're down to core psychological needs of, I might dissolve. My personhood might be gone. My identity, my yeah. reputation, which in a small town, anyone who lives in a small town knows, yeah. I mean, that's, it, it, it can be, it's done. You know, I mean, word spreads. I mean, it, it was walking everywhere and seeing the whisper, whisper, you know, or the, the turn of the head. It, it's, it is, I, I talk a lot about your know, primary loss and then secondary loss and tertiary loss. There's, I mean, there are these ripples that were immense, immense. And again, at the same time, working in the maternal health sector, trying to find panelists for sexual health topics and could find no one. There were two licensed sex therapists in the vicinity, one of whom taught from a purely Christian standpoint, totally their prerogative, totally fine. But if you didn't align with that, and my organization was not a faith-based organization, you kind of kind of had some run-ins. Yeah. Um, and then one was also a psychotherapist and was booked all the time. So sex therapy was not their only project. So we just kept running into a dead end there. So again, little moment, and then, then, <laughs> I get divorced and I'm standing there looking at myself in a mirror thinking, well, if my sexuality doesn't belong to my father or the church or my husband, who, who does it belong to? And so it started just this slow, slow, I don't even like to call it a deconstruction. I like to call it like an archeological dig. Um, and then finding out where these beliefs truly came from and then rebuilding who I wanted to be, rediscovering, regaining, um, reestablishing my own sexuality and what I even wanted. Right. <laughs> what, what felt good for me, what was good for me and what I was even looking for, what benefited me sexually as a human being. Um, and then I'm just a storyteller by nature. So people would be like, oh, you should teach on this. And I thought like, no, I can't, I don't have any, like Say I have those words out loud all day long. Less than education. I have zero sex education. So like what? I've read books like a couple, but like not enough. Um, so then, yeah, looked up an IC program and was like, oh yes, embodied, holistic, integrated. Yes. These are my words. Not, I don't just want science and I don't just want ooey gooey. I want something in the middle that understands that the mind and body are connected yeah. and, um, can also open my eyes outside of this 
tiny little town. I knew I wanted a truly inclusive and accepting and mind opening experience too. And yeah. And then retired from maternal health at the end of the year. And now here I am as a full-time sexuality educator. So that right there is to me the, the, the positive outcome that it is the potential of everyone being exposed to a, a broad array of options. Because I have an argument that if the cultural container you were in, if it had fit you, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't be here. It, some people are very well held by their religion. They're very well, like they, they feel like it's a, a glove that just fits just right. And they feel held, they feel nourished and nurtured. Awesome. And I still want them to have factual based sexuality related information, especially around how their body works and how pleasure works. And yet a lot of people don't feel held by the container that they're raised in. A lot of us don't. And your what I'm hearing is you had to really not just fight your way out of this very closed world, but out of your the, the trap of your own mind, because now you're inside yourself saying, not only was I supposed to be obedient to God, my father, my husband, but I'm also supposed to be obedient to something within. I'm, I'm supposed to be obedient to my obedience. So I find that people get trapped in this loop right there where like, I can't even contemplate leaving the bigger picture because I can't get out of my head. And I don't, I don't think, you know, it, indoctrination is so interesting too, right? Because I was, it was taught the catechism, the Presbyterian catechism when I was very little. And number one is I am justly deserving of the Lord's displeasure. And all the time, all the time, I am justly deserving of the Lord's displeasure and without him like lost, basically dead. Um, and so again, I, I always, always want individuals to know that if they feel held and have a sense of belonging from the community that they are in, I am not here to tear that apart. I believe that spirituality and sexuality can be this beautiful dance, this gorgeous celebratory dance. Um, and if you are not held or you feel like your education isn't quite providing you what you want it to, um, there, there are resources. <laughs> There are resources. There are, there are ways. Um, you don't have to go rogue. You can right. you can stay in a nice little lane. And yeah, I I don't know if that friend had not had dreams, like how much longer I would have just stayed because it might have been forever, you know, right. because it was serving me enough, you know. I it was serving me enough. Right. It, when you can stay in in uh, that little space, right? And you can be a little version of Lauren and that's it. And, you know, my, one of my core premises is that many people want to individuate. They want to, you know, get on a path of becoming the most you version of you possible. They, and they want to continue doing that. And it's not a state that we achieve and we like get to and like, boom, I'm, I'm individuated, but they want to be on that path and not everybody does. And the reason I bring that up is because I remember growing up in a Christian church and feeling, I, I did not feel shamed. I did not, like, I was not exposed to, I was out as bisexual. I don't remember anybody ever saying a word. It was just very like blase. They were like, I mean, we're not going to talk about sex, but it wasn't a big deal. And so I might have stayed in that world and it might've been big enough for me. Turns out, I mean, I have. I have many questions. I was that girl who was questioning my pastor at eight years old, like shaking his, shaking his pant legs and saying, how can you say that there's a, that there's a God, a benevolent God and there's a hell. And so I was that kid. So maybe I wasn't going to stay, but sex, sex is the thing that would have driven me out. If I had not felt like it was okay to be me, I would have left. And I wound up leaving in a very amicable, I had the like Oh, it was sort of an Irish goodbye. I just sort of wandered off and we never really spoke again. And yet that's okay. Like that has worked really well for me, right? There's a, there's an opportunity there for some people to just say, oh, you know what? I'm going to go seek elsewhere. 
for my spiritual nourishment. Absolutely, because no, no system could be all things for all people, nor should they ever feel the pressure to, right? I used to say to anyone who came, walked through the doors of our nonprofit, we might not be your cup of tea. And that's actually wonderful. And let me connect you to someone who can hold you and nourish you, right? Because I worked with people in pregnant and postpartum bodies and they deserve support. And I wasn't going to be, you know, our our team wasn't going to be crunchy enough for some, wasn't going to be medical enough for others, wasn't going to be this enough. Uh, That's okay. But let me find you a place of belonging. So I actually think it's fine when churches do that. Like, sure, you're ready to grow outside of this box or into another box. Bye. Whatever. Now, that said... I'm very curious about how this, so that's a, that's a hell of a way to have to grow up and then live a marriage for, uh, uh, on the order of years and then leave. And I'm thinking about the you I know from Instagram. And I'm thinking about the you who poses these, these beautifully sensual pictures, clearly in your body, feeling yourself aligned and you, you appear to have found a home in yourself. And I'm thinking between that, between trying to find a home in yourself and figuring out what relationship will be for you if it's not about obedience, where are you today? Partnership. Mm -hmm. I think that I could cry. (laughs) Um, I think what I didn't know enough about was the incredible aspects of partnership, of what partnership in all its ways, right? Of the beauty of asking for help, the beauty of knowing what you wanted or needed and asking for it and receiving it Mm -hmm. from work partnerships, from these types of conversations, right? From romantic partnerships too. And so now I would say I am so thankful that I have found myself in a partnership through, that's a whole nother fun story for another fun day, um, with a person who didn't grow up with any religious trauma, so always learning, and a um, person in a male body, uh, and but is so excited to like watch me in all my ways. Like, I I remember crying at one point because all the trauma, I want everyone to know that like you may survive purity culture, but those wounds, I mean, it's like a scar on your body. That scar tissue is woven in. So one night I'm crying in the kitchen. I'm just afraid I'm going to be too much. And he lifted my face up and looked at my face and said, oh, you're too much is one of the first things I fell in love with. Mm -hmm. Right. That's it. it. Find someone who loves you because of your idiosyncrasies, your too muchness, all your things, not in spite of that. That's how I was raised that like in spite of some, if someone will tolerate you, if someone will love you in spite of, you know, all the you that you are. And I, it's what a strange thing that so many of us, because certainly I know I have had so many friends over the years who were raised in one way or another, especially those of us born into, um, cisgender female bodies and then raised to be these women raised feminine right raised to be a woman who were taught in one way or another that we were just unacceptable as we are and yet I can't think of any parent who I would have ever spoken to who intended to raise their child that way including my own my parents are past now so I I, but I've had I had these conversations with them I didn't mean to indoctrinate this way. They didn't mean to. And so the walking out is still our, like, there's no one for me to, there's only me to walk out of this stuff. There's only you to walk out of your stuff. But I am so curious as a parent myself, what it is that I am unintentionally passing to them with, in fact, only the best of intentions. What is it? And I, and I, I enter into a state of inquiry with my kids around this. Like, what is it? What is it like to be raised by me because I'm yeah because there's no way we're not leaving our fingerprints my wise soul once told me it's not if we'll leave holes in our children's it's just which ones 
yeah. you know, we just will out of our own set of experiences. And I always say, all I can hope is that I give, I only have one child and yeah. person in a female body who identifies that way. And she, um, yeah, I just hope she has the tools. That's all right. Like I play therapy is amazing. I, you know, and I, I hope that, you know, it's, it can be more, I know I'm messing up exactly like you said, like, there's going to be something where she's like, I wish you would have just told me what to do <laughs> instead of yep. asking me. Cause what I was going to say is I hope that she can just make her own informed decisions based upon, you know, different things. But I bet I'm going to get to some place where she's like, it would have been really nice if you just told right. me what that's it. No matter, no matter which way we go, I have enough kids to, to be humble around the fact that there is just no way I'm going to get this right. Cause as soon as you have like three or four, you're like, Oh, you get to seven. You're like, Oh, there's just no way because they all need different things. And it becomes very, very apparent that there is not one comprehensive anything way. And this, this is interesting around sexuality education, because we think of comprehensive sex ed, but relationships are dynamic and changing and have so many moving parts that it's not as simple as opening up a book and saying, here's how you do it. I mean, <laughs> it's just, I wish it were that simple. I mean, I wrote Project Relationship because I, I had this moment. I woke up one day realizing that I might die and my children wouldn't be grown yet. And I wanted to have shared some of these relational lessons so that they didn't have to start from nowhere. And I, and I, you know, scr I scratched that thing out in a month. I was just like writing like mad because I was afraid of my own death and not helping the kids like stand on my shoulders instead of having to make it all up. That said, I look now and I see already my kids are the eldest is tw almost 23, you know, the, and, and then down to 14. So it, I can see how, yeah, my advice isn't the right fit for all of them at all times. Oh, I have a really critical thinker. Well, first I'm one of five. So I just, amen to everything you said, because <laughs> my, we're all so different and we were raised relatively within the same worlds, right? And uh, no, we are nothing, all five of us. So vastly different. And we all have the same parents. Um, but I have this, this person, this young human being that I'm raising observing is what I like to say. Yeah, like, that's it. Know. Yeah. Finding. Facilitating the growth of <laughs> feeding, feeding. I don't know. Um, but she will have conversations with me. Like, hmm, for instance, mom, she, yeah, I'm not going to talk about her sexuality, but like, when do you think would be a good time for me to start dating? I think 16, she's 11. I'm like, Oh, well, why do you think that? Right. She's just self-regulating in all yeah. of these ways. First, what do you think I should be? What do you think here? And sure, yeah, we, we talk about all, all the things, um, but so inquisitive, so planned, so yeah, just fast. You know, it's like their little brains. I'm like, who knows? Right. And the the more what I have noticed is the more um, the more options I lay out in front of them, the better and the more challenged. Cause they do sometimes want, like, can you just give me the answer? Just tell me how to make this work. And, you know, I, so I want to make a right turn in this, in this Good. interview. And I think this is a moment because having the answers, like knowing how to, to like get what you want feels like a really good spot to jump off in kind of a different direction, which is if you're raised with shame around sexuality, if you're raised in particular with shame or that's going to infiltrate all the ways you relate um, and what relationship is even supposed to be. Um, I've seen, I've seen a few people, a few clients who are trying very hard to break the relationship mold that they were raised with. So they want to have either monogamy plus, or they want non-monogamy, or they want a really explorative adventure into kink. They want something more. And they're clear on the wanting more, but the voice inside them is so loud. It is so loud. And there's so much opposition that even if their partner is a hundred percent on board and is like, yep, let's get on this train and go, we got it. There is just this immense amount of, well, scar tissue to work through. And I was wondering, cause I, I know that there's a bit of a story here from you and I would love to hear what it's been like for you to deal with that scar tissue and want to try something more. 
Oh, I would love to. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. And I don't get to talk about it often because I'm working mostly with folks who are not to that point, right? Like yeah. the, the, that that would be a conversation for a couple of years down the line for some clients. So. Yeah, first we want, like, can you find your orgasm? Do you know how your body works? Can you set boundaries? Absolutely. Usually, exactly. Yeah, all that stuff first. Yeah, oh, oh, we got a lot of other stuff to do. Um, but yeah, but personally, right? During my period of archeological digging, um, of course I came across so much incredible research and knowledge on consensual non-monogamy, um, of polyamory, of whatever, all the different names we love to name and label yeah, things. we love labels. Love it. It just makes everybody feel so much better. Um, and I remember thinking, oh, wow, okay, this makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it's always so funny, right? I'm sure you talk with God. The, the concept can sound delightful. Yeah, the philosophy is yum. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. And okay, so perfect examples are when I first started having casual sexual encounters is what I like to call them. Um, my poor little heart when I would know because it was all consensual and all, you know, everybody was sharing, like would know that one of these other partners had had another casual sexual encounter, which was all part of the relationship agreement. Oh my gosh, you would have felt like, like 5,000 people were stabbing me. And this was just in casual dating. Um, oh my gosh. I don't know if there's a name for that. Do you have a name for that? Like that initial period? Yeah. So it's interesting <laughs> that, that initial period, we could just call it dating. We could, right? <laughs> like if it weren't for mononormativity, right? Yes. If mono, if, if like habitual and like for, huh, I hate to use this word. It feels like a lot, but if normative monogamy yeah. is what we're given, then dating more than one person at a time can feel like a huge threat to the nervous system. It can feel like a huge threat to our belief system, even though there's nothing really in the rule book that says we like, you're not breaking monogamy. If you just break it down, mono one, married, gammy married. So you're not married. So you're not breaking that rule, but there's, it goes deeper than that. It is that compulsory, there's the word I was looking for, compulsory yes. monogamy. Elizabeth Emmons talks about this beautifully. Mm -hmm. That compulsory monogamy, it, it drives most of our culture around dating. And so then your poor heart, your poor heart. Your little baby heart. Alison Armstrong references, references it as this like biological primal, like need to be like protected from lions as a person in a female body, like back to like, caveman days, right? And if I can't out, out, out attract all these other people in female bodies, then will the caveman defend me, right? And so my nervous system felt like it was on this constant alarm. It, also, I've been thrown out of a community, right? I've also been- right. I've, You're I in do, trauma like, still. I'm literally in the wilderness. Like yeah. there's going to be a lion. I'm going to be eaten. Nobody cares. Like right. that's what my nervous system did. So so that was a great dating experience because that's exactly what it was. It was just dating. No one had claims on anybody's body, but I did. It, it was really good for me. It was really good for me to think through and get to decide that if consensual non-monogamy ever was a part of my future and part of my story in the future, I would want a primary partnership. I was like, I true, this was a really good moment for me. Cause I was like, no, I actually really enjoy partnership. I enjoy cohabitation. I enjoy shared work. Like I really, I really like get off on that. The like mental connection, sharing a home, sharing chores, really enjoy that. Enjoy um, like cooking food for a family. And so that was really good to say like, okay, yeah. oh, look, that's Name something it. you like that's Name not. It. That doesn't have to do necessarily with your upbringing. Sure, it, yes. uh, it contributed, but it's okay for you to want that. So that was like a good, like, whoo, okay. So then part of my little relationship story now with my current fiance, we, I call it my partner, but we are engaged, um, was that we dated, he moved here to my town from California. Then it was too much because the pandemic hit and he mm. was like, I cannot be in this tiny town only isolated with you because we had committed to not being each other's everything, not sexually at that point, but we were just like, nope, nope, don't like codependency. And then a pandemic kind of was like forced codependency. Oh, for so many people. Everybody, so it many was people. like, survive in this little grouping, please yeah. don't leave your house. I mean, it was, it was intense. 
So he left to go back to Long Beach. We broke up, dated other people. Um, and then we're like, nah, no, we really, there's, there's like a love here. We need to do yeah. this together. Um, so we started dating again, but it was going to be long distance cross country. And we said, you know what, what if we try primary partnership with, a, with consensual non-monogamy now, like if there's ever going to be a time, this is it. We're open heartedly. We discuss partners. We try to figure this out. We had, we had a Google doc that we would just sure. write back and forth to each other of like, this is an experience. We would let each other know if there was an opportunity, he was on some apps. I was not, mine were just like past casuals type of stuff. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it felt bad in my nervous system for my psyche. And I think this is what it's probably really good for any listener of ours to hear that I had to come to a point where, I mean, like laid out on the ground, I said, am I okay? Am yeah. I okay with the fact that my individual trauma has brought me to this point where this might not be okay for my nervous system. Yeah. And is it just as beautiful to choose something for myself that I don't think is as cutting edge or as evolved or as enlightened and uh, like, here you go again, Lauren, disappointing yourself. Can I love myself enough to truly think that this style of relationship is beautiful for some and yet respect and honor my own body enough to say, I can't do this. Um, the sex was wonderful. It was great, creative, wonderful sex with all these other people. It wasn't, no, no one harmed. My partner will say that he um, did not share completely that he had been in different sexual encounters with a previous relationship from years gone by. So there, there was a breach of trust, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you educate on all the time. I mean, it's the, it's figuring like figuring out how to talk about this. The cornerstone, right? Like right. that's so important. And so that, sh that was shaking, but it had almost less to do with that, more to do with my little personal experience, you know, lived experience up to that point. And I think what was really empowering for me was me getting to voice to this person I love so much that. I had come to the point where I loved myself enough that this needed to be a choice for me, but I loved him enough that if that meant relationship with me was not something that was right for his personhood, then I wished him all the love in the world. Like I, this, if, if consensual non-monogamy was for him, go have a beautiful life. Um, it wasn't going to work for me. And so it wasn't like a, you've got to choose. It was like, a, no, I that's partnership. Choose. That's partnership. <laughs> That's what you're describing. Can I say too, you are naming something that I, I feel really strongly about this. I think a lot of people hear about polyamory. They hear the philosophy. And in my research, I found that people, some people were philosophically aligned. Some people were behaviorally aligned. They were like, this is a choice I'm going to make. I could choose either way. And some people were orientationally aligned. They're like, this is me to the core. Maybe I don't have to act on it, but like, it's not going anywhere. And the number of people who felt philosophically aligned. Yeah. So many people are like, yep, that all makes sense. Check, check, check. Totally. I I'm not into possession, not into ownership. I'm like, good, good, good. But then you get down to the practice of it and it doesn't always feel like the right choice or the version of it that you think you have to do doesn't feel like the right choice. And this is where I think we need to start having more nuanced conversations around. It's okay to choose a hierarchy but talk about it, Ex be able to express that to your other partners. It's okay to choose monogamish, but express that. It's okay to choose swinging, which has like fallen out of favor as a concept. But if what you're looking for is sexual contact, but you're not, you're, you're polysexual, but you're not polyromantic. Great. There are so many options that, that in this realm of like creative monogamy, and polyamory and monogamy and like everything we could fit this all into this huge umbrella of love how do you want to love 
Yes. I use your term. I when you started using this beautiful term, creative monogamy, I told my partner, he was like, that's it. That's what we have. I was like, yeah. that's exactly it. That is exactly it. And it was funny. We decided to describe our journey with consensual non-monogamy as um like pickles. Um, and some people really like pickles. Um, and some people are not pickle people. And some people like certain kinds of pickles. Um, but we don't we don't despise anyone who likes pickles. We're not like, ooh you or oh. wrong with you why don't you like pickles <laughs> so Is we it? always equate it with that like no like it doesn't mean anything actually it just means that maybe your mouth didn't like the flavor of those pickles and right and now right now, now. Yes. Yes. When we ground this in, like, this is what feels good. This is why I really love when people set an intention and commitment and then set a date where they're going to revisit it, which doesn't mean we're going to change anything, but we're going to revisit it because you are a changing, growing human. Ken and I use an every three year policy. We completely renegotiate every three years and every year we do a full check-in, but every three years we have an actual off ramp, like no harm, no foul. You can get out of this we will just decide and we'll go to the mediation. We'll do the things. And that revisiting lets us stay so present in, I choose you. I choose me. Let's do this together. Like Terry and I say that daily, like yeah. I choose partnership, yeah. right? And it's about that choice because that's where the power is. And what's so funny is that that's like how I was raised with Christianity too, is that mm. Jesus Christ chose us. And so how beautiful is that? Right? So it's, it's just so funny. Like full circle right because right. yes the fact of that of being of a partnership model being chosen gives it all that much more beauty it's like oh right. this person wants to be here right and they want to do it this way and and if we have a discrepancy i see a lot of people who either start with a discrepancy or as they start to figure out how, like okay what are the ground rules how are we doing this what are our agreements they discover that there are discrepancies in a lot of places but negotiating around discrepancy is where we create something that is completely unique to this relationship at this point in time with this set of needs. I share a lot of times, like my brother died living in my house. Like he, he stayed with us. He went through cancer. He died. You think I was going out dating during that time? The answer is no. But was I less polyamorous? No. For me, it's an, it, I feel oriented to it. This is part of me. I, it's never separate from me. It has nothing to do with how many people I'm fucking and everything to do with how I've discussed, described, and felt into this. And then the, being in my agreements. And that actually reminds me very much of how I was raised in the church. And that, I guess, and I never really think about this. I, I was raised congregationalist and it worked pretty well for me because I got to choose. My parents didn't go. I, my grandma, my, my great aunt went. And so I just liked to go. She, she brought me when I was like in nursery school and then I just liked it. So I stayed. So I chose every single Sunday. It was me getting up and going, which meant I was always volitionally there, which meant when I was done, I was just done. And it was also gentle. And that, what a, I, I've never thought about how that modeled for me so cool. that oh, even yeah. in this like massively patriarchal system, I was at choice. You walked in. Right. You walked out, right? Yeah, and I can I, walk back in tomorrow, and it will yes. be okay, right? And I don't. I also don't like when we get like so accusatory towards systems, and I'm like, listen, folks. Sometimes systems help people, mm -hmm. and what what is powerful is our our ability to choose whether or not we go into or are removed from a system, right? Because marriage is a system. It's just constructs. Right. <laughs> systems they're everywhere like right. they're everywhere non-monogamy is a system too i mean we've got all this language we've got all these all and people like me teaching about it which means it starts to be a construction real quick they can all be used for for good or for really really bad and i think I think that goes to like the crux of who we are as human beings. Again, I think, I think we do really want belonging. And so I think it's like, Ooh, those people think like me, right. Even if it's, even if it's kind of like, I don't know, new agey or whatever, it's like, Ooh, let's go yeah. find them. And then before long, yep. We're doing the same damaging ramifications that more conservative systems do. And 
in my belief system, that can never be the answer. That the, right. the answer can never be the ostriches, ostrichization. Ostracization. Right? Yeah. But I like how there was an ostrich in yours. And because I think that's a good, yeah. if I were going to draw an image of it, it would be of the ostrich, like sticking their head in the sand and being like, all those people are gone now. All gone. Are gone. Just, that can't be the answer. Just I not. just, no, it can't be. The further I get removed from, yeah, fundamental reformed evangelical Christianity, the more I'm like, oh, it's everywhere. <laughs> These little constructs, like now. <laughs> right. There that, is no like safe haven to go to where you're like, oh no, yep, it's true. And so the only, the only possibility as I see it is for us to have these conversations and say, how can I help you feel like you belong? Like from where I am, we're not even in the same state. How can I help you feel like you belong? And one of the ways is by creating these conversations that we literally publicly put out. But another is just belonging to this, this community of people who've decided to take their own sex education in their hands take it in your hands and then, and then take it to be, make it whatever you want it to be. I love that you're doing that work with people. Would you tell people how they can find you? Cause I know some of my listeners are gonna be like, where has Lauren been my whole life? How can they find you so that they can? Okay. So website is simple sex ed for you.com. Um, and then Instagram handle is very similar if you type in sex ed for you, you will find me. There's some underscores in there, but it's not necessary. Um, Facebook at sex ed for you. Um, I just started TikTok. I am too old. I don't <laughs> want to do TikTok. I was just daughter. told to be on TikTok myself and I'm 10 years older than you. So oh, I think yeah. we're just going to have to be on the, on the TikTok train. I we can uh, bolster each other. Do it, we'll do it together. <laughs> My Instagram friends are all like these videos, which the things that are great are being referenced are these videos that I make just kind of in one minute deconstructing some of purity culture and educating because for me that's important for me it's important that we don't make decisions because other individuals told us to um that's just a perpetuation of everything that harmed me and so I always want any student of mine and a client of mine to decide for themselves to decide for themselves. So yeah, all those are the handles. If anyone wants to send me an email, it's Lauren at sex ed for you. Um, I do six week courses, group courses, because I think there's such power in group yeah. education and normalization and the me too feeling. Um, so so I you're do helping do people with group, you have, you have group offerings where people can be in connection and in community with other people who have been touched by purity culture, have grown up in it, have been impacted by it because the, the way out is through more belonging, right? And I can't even, uh, group education has always been phenomenal for me. And it's something that I've gotten to do, thankfully, for over a decade. And, uh, you know, I think if we're deconstructing those types of systems, we also have to deconstruct like teacher student, this like mm -hmm. this hierarchical dichotomy yeah. of uh, she told me to. Yeah. Right? So it's so amazing to watch these attendees, students, whatever you want to call them, teach the group, bring their wisdom, bring what has begun in them, what they're stumbling across. So yeah, all of my group classes are a nice small group. Eight to 10 is my max. My preference is about six individuals in a group. We always have a WhatsApp ch chat that's going on at the same time. So there's community. There's that sense of belonging. Um, so do those. I do some for tweens and people in like middle school bodies because that's how old my kid is right now. Um, and then I do one-on-one -on -one education. And I would say the primary clientele that I serve right now is folks trying to stumble through purity culture ramifications yeah. Um, whether they're still happily in a monogamous, heterosexual, heteronormative marriage, they just are like, oh, I don't know what pleasure is. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I enjoy working with that too. I'm not here to just blow up everything. <laughs> I'm not here to like. We'll make... see if future Lauren is there, but for now. <laughs> you know, I, I just, yeah. I love that though. So people can find you at sex ed for you. And really for anybody who's listening to this, who's thinking, I didn't even realize that I maybe grew up either in purity culture or purity culture adjacent, or perhaps that's my partner. You, I can imagine some of my listeners hearing a reflection of like, Oh, maybe that's what's going on for my partner, because you have a very extreme and crisp and clear vision of what happened for you. But I know that there's 
there's a lot of um, lighter shades of gray there that where people might still be impacted by this. So I want to encourage you to follow Lauren and, and reach out because this is something we've never talked about. And the only reason Ken didn't join me is because I knew that you and I were going to get right into it. But knowing that there is a resource, he was like, oh, thank God, somebody's going to talk about this because he saw it. He grew up at the Baptist church and he saw it. He knows yes. there is shame everywhere. So if you're shamed, know that there are people to help you walk out of the shame rather than add to it. And if you're not even sure, I think Instagram's a perfect place to start learning about that. A perfect spot. Thank you so, so much, Lauren, for being with me today. I couldn't possibly be happier. And I'm certain that we'll have to have you back. We'd love that. I would love to talk about, yeah, you know, that Lauren in a few months who's blowing up things, you know? Right. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks everybody for listening to Project Relationship. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I have one more thing to share with you. If you want to pop over to listen to Jolie.com, that's just listen to Jolie, J-O-L-I.com, you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Yeah, get the guides. They're easy to implement conversations that will empower you to create the love you want. It's my mission to make everything talk aboutable. Sex, love, losses and learns. Everything is talk aboutable. <laughs> she managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my lovers, my friends, my family, and you all on a podcast out loud. Relationship work really can change everything. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way you'd hoped, remember relationships can be messy and that's good news. 